Yeah. So like I was telling you, though, I, I've been kind of struggling to get my wife's attention. But uh, I found if I just, you know, sit down and get comfortable, I it that 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 does the trick every time. But anyway, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Kyle Whittington, uh, kind of back from a little bit of a break. Uh, you know, had the kid uh, fifth baby. Uh, he's doing very well. Uh, so, and all of you who donated and shared the GoFundMe link, I appreciate that. Uh, I did go ahead and turn off the donations for that. We are more than taken care of, and I was starting to feel guilty about like getting even more help. So, uh, so thank you all for that. So, uh, Dom, so I've got Dom Dalmaso, uh, here from the Logos Project. I've got his channel linked down in the description. So, uh, you know, Dom does a lot of really good work. Uh, he, it's so funny. Uh, so Dom and I are both apologists in uh, Cross the Tiber. And ever since you've joined, that entire yeah. group has just elevated a little bit because... Really? It's just... Oh, yeah. Well, because like whenever I'm putting my stuff in, it's very like... I, I, I want to call it kind of like blue collar apologetics where it's just like, okay, oh. whatever. <laughs> and here you are. It's like, well, here's why I love uh ratzinger's you know uh, <laughs> theology and you give this yeah. beautiful explanation and it's just like okay all right and <laughs> Thanks, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no every single one of them reads like a like a theology paper and which is which is a compliment <laughs> so thank you but uh but yeah so well it's great uh, to be on your show um yeah yeah so yeah so uh i asked dom to come in here today to help me out with this uh for this topic because I, I tried to do it solo i tried to pre-record it and it just wasn't working. Um, and those of you who have had any experience recording stuff, it's it's weird just talking to a cold and dead camera. So, yeah. um, but uh, anyway, so uh, I'm going to do most of the talking, and and uh, Dom's going to be here to basically uh, flex his uh, theology degree and smack <laughs> me whenever I get things wrong. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Or just interject and uh, give you some pushback or something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. So um, anyway, I'm going to start this off with a little bit of an analogy that's going to include a familiar situation that most of us have probably dealt with at some time in our lives. So my son was in the living room building something out of Legos. And my daughter comes in and she just kicks it down. She tears it apart, breaks it to pieces. Um, uh, and yeah, so my son's obviously very upset about this. He stands up and he punches her in the mouth and now she's bleeding. Okay, Dom, I just want to ask you, who's the good guy in this situation? Dang. Well, what did the punch look like? I'm kidding. Uh, both bad guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like both yeah. kids are going to be in trouble. So because yes, while my son was a victim to an in injustice, he overreacted. He didn't do the right thing. And yeah. now he's also in trouble here. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I was like, yes, my daughter was wrong to destroy his stuff. But then he was also wrong to uh, to, to punch my daughter in the mouth. Yeah. So um, and now so we're going to tie this into the situation of Father Altman. Now, um, I just want to just get this up here real uh, up front real quick. I know there have been reports of. Uh, perhaps that he's been laicized already. I've not seen anything official. I've seen a one tweet that was a secondhand account. Um, that's not an official communication. So until I see something official, I will continue to call him uh, Father Altman uh, mm -hmm. until I get corrected. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I understand that there's some confusion here and that there's... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I could be wrong yeah. here, but I would rather give him too much respect rather than too little respect. Yeah, I don't know whether he's been lay-sized or not. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know either. Like, uh, you believe it or not, I've actually... Uh, the, the the Bishop of La Crosse actually has never once called me and asked me uh, for my opinion on how the best way to handle things is. Um, he didn't call you? Oh, he called me. No, he didn't call me. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe somebody out here, they, they he called him. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, so anyway, but let's tie it to his situation, to Father Altman's situation. Okay, obviously... If you are watching this stream, you know that there are some issues going on in the church. Uh, you know, just to name a few, you know, we've got German bishops who seem dead set on trying to leave the church. Uh, Pope Francis says a lot of really confusing things. He does things, to say the least, that are rather scandalous. And like for years to come, we're still dealing with them. Uh, 
And it seems like there are some leaders that are trying uh, to undermine the faith, or at least that's the story that gets pushed. Um, whether or not that's what they're truly doing, I don't know. I'm not trying to like assign intent to men that I've never met. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, but it, it's regardless of what the intents are, there's clearly a problem here. Yeah. And um, so Cotton, I, I want to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just what one thing, one point that I want to interject, which is I, I, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. The way I like to think about it is to, to, to talk about there's the teaching of the church right now, uh, the teaching of the papal magisterium, and then there's the politics of this pontificate. And right. I see those as being, in fact, contradictory, uh, mm. which is actually a good thing because the politics of this pontificate are not – they don't look very good. <laughs> and so right. hopefully the teaching of, of the, the papal magisterium is, in fact, not in line with that. And I think it isn't. But sorry, I just wanted to interject that. Yeah. No, and I think that's a very good distinction is that, like, despite having – and I, I'll use Pope Benedict IX as an example. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Benedict the Ninth. Um, not a canonized saint. Uh, he was elected to the papacy three times. Uh, I think the first time that he was elected, he was like 19. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and from what I understand is that like, whenever he was Pope, he, he made the, I don't want to, whatever he, he did a lot of debauchery, a lot of like really awful things in the Vatican. And mm -hmm. like it was it was not a holy place or it didn't look like a holy place whenever he was in charge. So I don't I don't want to like so there have been arguably just straight up villains in the chair of Peter before. And whenever people right. tell me that this is the worst pontificate, I kind of have a hard time taking that seriously, knowing uh, knowing some of the, the the dastardly villains that have been pope before right. in centuries prior so uh but yeah uh, but uh oh hey we actually do have somebody uh from no. the diocese of lacrosse here so i am in the diocese of lacrosse after seeing father altman's vid video yesterday i asked my priest what bishop callahan is doing about him laicization excommunication father martin said we may find out after new year okay cool so okay. until until then until then um i will i will continue to call him father martin so uh thank you thank you for that clarification father uh, altman. you're confusing <laughs> i think it's uh, actually altman, very yeah. telling that uh anyway because uh, i i can't anyway i better not say that go ahead go ahead kyle yeah go ahead go ahead yeah uh so anyway uh back to okay so there's a situation there's a problem here and there are leaders in the church that will be held accountable for this at their judgment cool I just I just wanted to make it extremely clear that I'm not denying that there's a problem or that I'm I'm saying that like I'm on board with some of the nonsense as because I'm not. All right. Yeah. Now back to Father Altman. He's also wrong to deny the papacy of of, of Pope Francis. Like th so you know, we've got scandalous leaders and we've got a uh we've got a priest denying the 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 legitimacy of a papacy who's the good guy here yeah back to the analogy right they're both exactly wrong. it's like they're both wrong exactly yeah. so you know I, I say this a lot and it's the path is narrow you know it, that that's straight from scripture the path is narrow and you know what satan doesn't care if you're too far to the left or you're too far to the right as long as you're off the path satan wins yeah so whenever we have these problems it, the wrong thing to do is just do a reactionary overcorrection because, mm -hmm. okay, well, if you're supposed to be going east, well, these guys are going north. These guys are going south. You know, both of those are the wrong direction. So, yeah. you know, even though they're, the, they're opposites. So, so that's just, <sighs> yeah. Uh, anyway. Well, we, Kyle, I, get, I get this a lot as well. When I bring up a criticism about something that, um, you know, is popular in certain circles. Uh, the response I usually get is like, we, well, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, this this uh, criticism of the of the Second Vatican Council that people are having and that they shouldn't have it, and that's a problem. And yet, why aren't you talking about, or what's the problem with, uh, you know, Father James Martin? You know, we we have bigger problems in the church, right? And I think it's like, well, 
you don't only always have just one problem. You can have several problems. There's nothing wrong right. with with realizing that there's problems with Father Martin and Germany, and there's problems with Sedevacantism and Schism, right? Yeah. So it's like you don't have to pick one over the other. That right, it implies a kind of turf war that's already like playing out, and you're you're taking a side. But when the fact that the fact of the matter is, the church doesn't take sides. She takes a side yeah. of truth, which doesn't. You know, it's not this binary bipartisan battle anyway. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, there's so many analogies that popped in my head of that. But like, I think maybe some of them are a little too intense to air out publicly. So maybe okay. I'll <laughs> maybe I'll talk about those uh, at a later time. But Sounds good. Uh, but anyway, so whenever it comes to this, you know, you cannot. You can't fight confusion and scandal with sin. Think back to the Lord of the Rings. You know, whenever Boromir is looking at the ring and he's going, so it's like, oh, it is a gift. We, you know, we can use this to fight the enemies of Mordor. That's what some of this rebellion and disobedience is, is like. It's like the ring. It's so tempting. It's just like, ooh, we can use this. It's a gift. And it's, you cannot fight sin with sin. That doesn't work. Yeah. You know, like Aragorn said, you know, you cannot wield it. You know, it, mm -hmm. it only serves Sauron, you know. Sin yeah. only serves Satan. So, yeah, you cannot make a deal with the devil on this. And, you know, knowingly or unknowingly. Yeah. And, yeah. So, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so to be perfectly honest with you, I, I don't really follow, you know, uh, Father uh, Altman. I um, I don't follow on the, uh, either on the other side. I don't follow Father James Martin either. Um I think a lot of people are caught up with um, uh, people that are validating the way that they feel and the way they feel is understandable. And so they're looking for some validation yeah. in the web because it's an available space. Uh, but unfortunately there can be people who validate how you feel and yet are talking a little bit of nonsense on the side or a lot of nonsense on the side. And so that that's not a criterion that they validate a legitimate frustration in me. Yeah. Therefore, I'm going to canonize everything they say. So I think like people yeah. need to unplug and stop seeking for validation, even though I understand how they feel, and plug back into the essentials of the faith and live the faith in a I think a more expansive way in a less in a less constricted way that's controlled by the internet. You know. So that's yeah. that's kind of what I would add. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing is, is that like, and you know what, this, I, I probably shouldn't say this, it probably do terrible things to my retention, but like, y'all, if if you, if, if, if I asked you, when was the last time you cracked open the Bible, and you yeah. say, if it's been more than a week, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to, turn <laughs> this off right now and go do that. The scripture is going to have mm -hmm. way more valuable value than literally anything that I could ever say. Um, right. And I just lost two viewers. Pr thanks be to God. Oh, that. <laughs> OK, thanks be to God. That is that is that is amazing. So but anyway, yeah. uh, but like, no, you know, but, the faith yeah. doesn't it, the faith doesn't is not lived out on the Internet. It's it, that's a part of our lives now. So, yes, we're going to live it out there, but it doesn't like exist there, if that makes right. sense. The mm -hmm. faith is in the real world. So like, you know, if you go online to find all this stuff, it's yeah. But you yeah. Uh, uh okay, so he, he goes, uh oh uh clarification from uh Light of Christ Press. My parish priest is Father Sam Martin Martin, uh, who has taught many times on the inner life on relevant radio. Oh, cool. Nice. So okay, so not a father James Martin. So cool. All right, so but like you were saying, like, OK, he does have some valid points and, you know, that, that there's some valid has a sense of validation. But, mm -hmm. you know, whenever it comes to, you know, what, what about the good things that he's saying? Can't you just pay attention to the good things that he's saying? You know, well, can you? Because my mind goes back to the 16th century and realizing that Martin Luther had some really good points. You know, there were abuses, there were scandals in his time. You know, the, the church is no stranger to scandal. Yeah. So, you know, Martin Luther, whenever he nailed the 95 theses to the, uh, you know, the, the Wittenberg Cathedral, which was essentially just posting a notice on the community bulletin board, it wasn't <laughs> some grand defiant act. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, whenever whenever you see that, it's like, well, you know, Martin Luther had some good points, too. But that doesn't mean that, like, you can't just look past the fact mm -hmm. that, like, he shattered the church and we are still dealing with those consequences to this day. Yeah. So that's why it's it's super important to say, like, yes, the leaders in the church in his day were wrong, but he was also wrong for doing this. And his actions seemingly have been the most detrimental to the church, uh, yeah. you know, ever since. So um, there's this book by, um, oh, dang, I forgot the author. Um, it, 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 uh, Jeremiah Bannister talks about it often. It's called Enthusiasm. What, what's the name? Uh, Ronald oh, yeah. Knox. Yeah. Yep. And so in the, in the opening of the book, it, it points to, um, you know, certain either individuals or communities um, or just certain like movements or ways of thinking that latch on to very good things, but, mm -hmm. uh, but they're being treated poorly by other people. And so they tend to see those things and weaponize them against uh, the larger church. And then the church deals with them very poorly. He gets into how usually the authorities in the church deal with these movements very, very poorly. He even, I think says at one point, stupidly, and, and it right. leads to this, this, uh, you know, tug of war, eventually division. And, and centuries later, we look back, we're like, well, they had some good points, but what, what the hell are they thinking? <laughs> you know? Right. And so it's like, I think there's a lack of perspective going on here. And that book by Ronald Knox is uh, very enlightening. It's, it's, um, it's theological and it's like very good at like pointing out the sociology and the, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Enthusiasm by Ronald Knox. Uh, yeah, yep. especially like the opening of the first chapter, it was uh, very telling. So unfortunately, I see I see a lot of that going on, and people are upset about certain things because of the way the faith is experienced and lived where they are, com you know, in contrast, yeah, to what, in relationship to Rome or other places in the world. And it's like that that's you know that's the crisis, and they they just they lose their minds, and they forget yeah. what the church really is. I, I think that's yeah, what's yeah. So all of this is to say, though, is that, you know, none of this gives license for schism. Um, and yeah, I guess it's like you're saying, the, the, the church historically, like, doesn't deal well with these enthusiasts. No. Uh, yeah. Now, there is something that I want to say. One of the really cool things about being Catholic is that, you know, we have a wealth of saints to look to and say, yeah. like, OK, well, how would a saint handle this situation? And uh, have you ever seen the movie The Reluctant Saint? Oh, I haven't, but I know it's about, uh, um, is it St. Joseph Cupertino? Yes. So yeah. that is one of my favorite movies, and it's for, it's available for free on YouTube. So, yeah, uh, it. If, yeah uh, it's, I mean, low quality, obviously, but uh, one of the cool things is, is like there's this kind of like this bad friar. Uh, mm. He's played by the same guy who played Khan in The Wrath of Khan. <laughs> who apparently is a very devout Catholic guy. Really? So yeah. So a little, little fun history for you there, but okay. So, okay. And then the other thing about that movie, I just want to give it dis some disclaimer. Some uh, creative licenses were taken uh, just to make the movie more entertaining. And uh, there was even uh, Trinitarian heresy in there. Anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. um, but well, yeah, so he, he, I think he, uh, he tries to explain the the Trinity via partialism, but anyway, um, oh, I see. <laughs> but um, yeah, but okay. The real Saint Joseph Cupertino wasn't very bright, but he was incredibly holy. Mm -hmm. He became a priest, and whenever he became a priest, the stories the the stories go is that he would actually levitate while he was celebrating Mass. Now, mm -hmm. because he was dumb, and because you know, he seemingly got like all these special favors and, and holiness, whatever. He got the scorn of a lot of his peers and superiors. Mm -hmm. So whenever he started levitating during mass, like the assumption was that it was demonic. So he was, oh, you know, went up to the Inquisition um, and yeah, he was unjustly confined to his cell for 35 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now. His superiors yeah. were wrong to do that. And in hindsight, we see that very clearly. This man was a saint and that and instead of like making him freely available to the public, they confined him to his cell for 35 years. So what did Saint Joseph of Cupertino do? Did he 
run out and 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 go and start a new religious order? Did he start a petition to try to get them to change their mind? Did he, you know, start a coalition? Nope. Didn't he, didn't he start a YouTube channel? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, yeah, so right. Joseph Cupertino, I think he <laughs> created the very first YouTube channel back in the uh, 17th century. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but anyway, instead of, of doing all of that, he remained obedient. And on top of that, even more, he added bitter powder to his food to make the experience even more ascetic. Dang. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I wouldn't. That's either. also why I'm, you know, I'm not celebrate I'm not levitating after receiving <laughs> communion or or whatever. So yeah. um yeah, so it's just that's what a saint handles unjust persecution from uh religious superiors. That's what that looks like. Mm -hmm. But like to go online and like deny the papacy of Pope Francis, no, that's I don't think you're going to find a single saint doing that. However, you see many Protestants and, you know, other heretics doing that. Uh, those are not the models. Uh, those are not the models of the faith that we're, we're going to follow. So, and can I add uh, just a quick point about, um, I didn't watch the whole video. I kind of, I figured. Oh, I didn't watch it at all. Oh, okay. I watched part <laughs> I of the it. title. Someone sent it to me and I saw the title. and I was like, Oh, what's this? <laughs> and yeah. so I watched part of it, but, the the one thing that i want to point out is that there was this um attitude of glee and satisfaction at the fact that pope francis and his cronies as uh father puts it will be burning in hell so there was this kind of happiness with that that strikes me as not really the fruit Ooh. of of charity and of um, you know a, a constructive criticism because of a love of the church it's, I think it's more of um, we're angry with the situation we're in, which I understand that the situation for some people, the way that they are, are um, interacting with the church right now, they're very frustrated. But if that's the answer, there's a lot of things we got to start questioning. <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've got this a little later in my outline, but I think it's, it's appropriate to bring it up now. Mm -hmm. If you think that the Pope and his cronies, so-called cronies, are yeah. going to hell, like and if you're confident in that, I think yeah. the the appropriate response is to fall down on your knees and beg for mercy on their behalf. Yeah. Um, I, I I think like how would you, you know, know that? Like, did God reveal that to someone? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, there there is that famous line from Saint John Chrysostom um, of. Uh, you know, the road to hell is paved with the bones of priests and monks and the skulls of bishops are the lampposts that light that light the path mm -hmm. and which it, you know, Jesus talks about millstones, you know, that's a, that's, that's not a joke. So mm -hmm. that the, the responsibilities that's placed on these priests and bishops is a very, very, very great responsibility. Yeah. So yeah, actually it, there, there is some truth to be said there of like, Hey, if these guys don't do their job well, that's going to that <laughs> that could threaten their salvation because yeah. they're going to be leading other people astray, mm -hmm. which basically just goes to say, like, hey, this is why we need to pray for them. Like yeah. we as the faithful, what are we doing to help them? I, right. I think it was uh, St. Teresa of Avila and I, somebody could correct me on this if they if, if they know better. I think it was St. Teresa of Avila that said. You know, every priest has a demon behind him fighting for his damnation. So mm -hmm. if we have the words to criticize our priests, then we mm -hmm. need to have twice the words to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And that goes for Father Altman as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, hey, hey, y'all uh, who are watching, especially 12 of you who are live right now and everybody in the future, take note on how long this video is, because, yes, we are criticizing Father Altman. I would recommend mm -hmm. that you go take like a holy hour or or whatever, um, specifically as twice as long as this lasts for his benefit. Uh, I mean, don't be legalistic about it, but you know, don't just sit here. This is not the uh, let's just. This isn't the we're gonna crap all over Father Altman show. Uh, mm -hmm. This is like there's some serious concerns here. I think that they're worth addressing, and uh, because this is a. It's a, it's a, 
it's a confusing time. And I think the overload of information isn't exactly a good thing. So I agree with you that yeah. there's so much information coming in. But uh, yeah, we need to focus more on the uh, word and sacrament. Yeah. And yeah, it's just eyes on the prize, guys. Uh, you know, fix your, fix your eyes on Jesus because that's what this is all about. It's not about me. It's not about you. Um, this is about our Lord and serving him. So I, I, I don't know. The, I keep going back and forth, like whether even I should be on YouTube or not, because it mm. seems like these, uh, I mean, I, the furthest thing from a celebrity. I like to say that I'm like a, uh, you know, if you're Steubenville famous, that's already a form of like pseudo micro famous. And yeah. I'm like pseudo micro Steubenville famous. So <laughs> if I put enough qualifiers on it, I can get to that point where almost everybody yeah. qualifies. And that's, 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 that's yeah. where I'm at. But like, <laughs> even then, like these, these talking heads on the internet, it's just like, are they even worth it? Like, am I, am I part of the problem here? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, but like, it's even worse for priests because it's just like, you know, the internet's a very powerful tool and you can reach people and you can get a message out there. That's really, really, really good. But also Satan knows that as well. And I can't help but think that for all the good things that Father Altman actually did have to say, you know, Satan was going to use that to like bring him down. Like it's like, hey, I want mm -hmm. to bring you down because <clears throat> any good that you have, I want it tainted so that nobody will ever listen to you. And at this point, he's he's set himself up against the church. If that was say, Satan's mission, I would say that that's a mission accomplished at this point. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want me to read that? Do you want me to keep this quote from? Yeah. So uh, let me go ahead and get into uh, a sure, little bit of, uh, you know, we kind of already touched on a little bit, but I, I, you know, I do a lot of the comment moderation on the Council of Trent. And every time Trent does a video, that's something like this. Uh, mm -hmm. I always get com uh, comments of like, oh, why aren't you talking about the, the crazy liberals that are destroying the church and stuff like that? So there's a couple of reasons why we're not specifically going after them. Um, one is that my guess is that if you're watching this video, you and I are already on the same page there. And there's an even more than decent chance that you know more about that, about those situations than I do. So... Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you already believe and what you already know. That's not going to help you or be a good use of my time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that those guys pretty sure they don't watch this channel. Yeah. So they're not going to listen to me. So why should I waste my time trying to reach them whenever I've got concerned faithful, such as yourselves who are watching this? So that's, that's why I'm doing this. So, um, now I don't want to uh, I don't want to say that that doesn't mean that you know, we just throw our heads in the sand and we ignore it. Uh, you know, Canon two twelve subsection two says the Christian faithful are free to make known to the pastors of the church their needs, especially spiritual ones and their desires. And I'm, Dom, I know you've got a wonderful quote from Ratzinger loaded up, so I'm going to let you fire away at that. I'm going to give you the whole screen. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So it's, it's a pretty lengthy quote, but I read it the other day, and I thought it, I thought it was so beautiful and so pertinent that I actually copied it, and I posted it on my uh, website and uh, as an article and shared it with some friends. But here it goes. Um, it's from uh, Joseph Ratzinger when he was a priest, when he wrote uh, – it's in Introduction to Christ Christianity, pages 342 to 345, but it's not too long. <laughs> so it starts uh, talking about the church being holy. Is the church not simply the continuation of God's deliberate plunge into human wretchedness? Is she not simply the continuation of Jesus' habit of sitting at table with sinners, of his mingling with the misery of sin, to the point where he actually seems to sink under its weight? Is there not revealed in the unholy holiness of the church, as opposed to man's expectation of purity, God's true holiness, which is love? Love that does not keep its distance in a sort of aristocratic, untouchable purity, but mixes with the dirt of the world in order thus to overcome it. Can, therefore, the holiness of the church be anything else but the bearing with one another that comes, of course, 
from the fact that all of us are born up by Christ. And he continues here, At bottom there is always hidden pride at work when criticism of the church adopts that tone of rancorous bitterness, which today is already beginning to become a fashionable habit. Unfortunately, it is accompanied only too often by a spiritual emptiness in which the specific nature of the church as a whole is no longer seen, in which she is only regarded as a political instrument whose organization is felt to be pitiable and brutal, as if the real function of the church did not lie beyond organization, in the comfort of the word and of the sacraments that she provides in good and bad days alike. Those who really believe do not attribute too much importance to the struggle for the reform of ecclesiastical structures. They live on what the church always is. And if one wants to know what the church really is, one must go to them. For the church is most present, not where organizing, reforming, and governing are going on, but in those who simply believe and receive from her the gift of faith that is life to them. Only someone who has experienced how, regardless of changes in her ministers and forms, the church raises men up, gives them a home and a hope, a home that is hope, the path to eternal life. Only someone who has experienced this knows what the church is, both in days gone by and now. This does not mean that everything must be left undisturbed and endured as it is. Endurance can also be a highly active process, a struggle that make a, a struggle that to make the church herself more and more that which supports and endures. After all, the church does not live otherwise than in us. She lives from the struggle of the unholy to attain holiness, just as, of course, this struggle lives from the gift of God, without which it could not exist. But this effort only becomes fruitful and constructive if it is inspired by the spirit of forbearance, by real love. And here we have arrived at the criterion by which that critical struggle for better holiness must always be judged. A criterion that is not only not in contradiction with forbearance, but is demanded by it. And this is the key point that Ratzinger says right here. He says, this criterion is constructiveness. A bitterness that only destroys stands self-condemned. A slammed door can, it is true, become a sign that shakes up those inside. But the idea that one can do more constructive work in isolation than in fellowship with others is just as much of an illusion as the notion of a church of holy people instead of a holy church. That is holy because the Lord bestows holiness on her as a quite unmerited gift. There's one more paragraph, Kyle. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, keep going. Okay. This is the final paragraph here. He says, this brings us to the other word applied to the church by the creed. It calls her Catholic. The shades of meaning acquired by this word during the course of time are numerous, but one main idea can be shown to be decisive from the start. This word refers in a double way to the unity of the church. It refers first to local unity. Only the community united with the bishop is the Catholic church. Not the sectional group that not the sectional groups that have broken away from her for whatever reasons, for whatever reasons. Second, the term describes the unity formed by the combination of the many local churches, which are not entitled to encapsulate themselves in isolation. They can only remain the church by being open to one another, by forming one church in their common destiny to the word and in the communion of the Eucharistic table which is open to everyone everywhere. In the old commentaries on the creed, the Catholic church is contrasted with those churches that only exist, quote, from time to time in their provinces, provinces, end quote, and thereby contradict the true nature of the church. Thus, the word Catholic expresses the Episcopal structure of the church and the necessity for the unity of all the bishops with one another. And that's how he ends. And I just want to add that that unity of the bishops requires a sign of unity, and that's the Petrine Sea. And so yeah. there you have it, a whole package, constructive criticism, humility, true love, what is the holiness of the church, and how do we understand that in light of the sins of its members, and then communion, Catholicity. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just real quick, what, 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 what writing is that from? 
Or what work is That's that from? That's from uh, Ratzinger's Introduction to Christianity. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I can link the what I just read. In, uh, I can give you the link if you want to put it in the show. Yeah. No. To. Absolutely. Yeah. Give me that, and I'll put the I'll put that link down in the description for for the future. Uh, so, you know, so back to the Canon two twelve. It and you know it's like we we need are free to make known to the pastors of the church their needs, especially spiritual ones and their desires. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Well, if you're if you're gonna talk to your bishop. It looks like writing a respectful, charitable, and short letter. <laughs> um, if you write a doctoral thesis and it gets to your bishop's desk, he's going to put it in the trash. <laughs> it's just like he's got an entire diocese to run. He doesn't have time to read your 30-page essay. Yeah. Not, the, not that a doctoral dissertation is only going to be 30 pages. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you could try to turn that in, but that would just be like, <laughs> be serious? Um, but uh, yeah, so it's just... You can do that. Write a letter to your priest or, you know, better yet, like if you have a relationship with your priest, talk to your priest about it. You know, it, there's a decent chance that your priest is going to know something that you don't that might he might be able to add some context that's going to uh, alleviate you. Or you might have like in the case that I have dealt with in the past of a priest advocating for a woman priesthood from mm. the pulpit on yeah. the feast of the assumption oh. and uh yep yeah that that yeah that happened uh so it's just like yeah confront them uh you know send a letter to the bishop like that at least in the archdiocese of st louis they keep track of all that stuff like that that's not something mm -hmm. that gets ignored so yes that you're allowed to do that but keep it respectful keep it charitable keep it short mm -hmm. um and but and I just want to give a quick example of what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like writing Facebook posts <laughs> on your Facebook where you're not friends with your priest or your bishop and you definitely not the Pope or, you know, tweeting about it, complaining. Okay. That's the kin to just go into the public square with a megaphone and just yelling about it. That's not what that looks like. And what okay? is that? So that's, do? yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just like you're that's not a fraternal correction. That's gossip. Yeah. That's closer to gossip. So oh. it's just like that's not actually helping. And I don't care how wrong I don't care if the Pope is fathering bastards and appointing those children as cardinals, which has happened in the church. That's that that has been a thing that has happened. It's documented pretty well. I don't care if he's doing that, you still don't do that. That your job doesn't change regardless of like how wrong the leader is 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 acting and you know you and i are both veterans so like we kind of understand like i mean whenever you were in the military did you ever have a bad supervisor did you ever have a bad leader uh, did i ever have a good one you mean just kidding yeah exactly <laughs> so but it's just like hey uh what do you what do you call a what do you call a stupid uh e5 <laughs> not sure sergeant <laughs> like I call them sergeant like <laughs> Yeah. So it, it, it's just like, yeah, he might he might not be the brightest. He might be doing things really wrong that doesn't invalidate his authority unless a proper authority comes in and steps it in. I've been very careful to continue to call Father Altman Father Altman because a proper authority has not let me know to no longer do that. And until that happens, he is still Father, Father Altman, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm open to being corrected on that. But so I, I do want to talk about, um, you know, I guess the main the main point of this entire stream, and it's just if you're here, you made it this far, you're listening to us. This video is to encourage you guys to remain virtuous. All right, have the humility to respect the office of the ministers above you. Okay. Christ is king. This is not a democracy. All right. So Christ is king. He's up at the top and the Pope is his vicar and the bishops and priests are his ministers. Those belong to Jesus Christ. This is not a democracy. We do not elect them. The only way that we, you and I can have an impact on the church's hierarchy is by becoming a priest or fathering lots of sons 
and <laughs> them becoming priests, bishops, and eventually the Pope. So, like, and all of that entails living out your vocation, living out your faith as you know boldly as you possibly can, all under that protective umbrella of obedience. Um. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, and I think I, this might actually be reassuring to people, and yet it's kind of a dark thing to say, but a lot of the chaos in, in the Western world, you know, in the Catholic Church in general, uh, you know, universally, in its its leaders and, and its its so-called members, those who are kind of, uh, what's it called, the uh, Christer Catholics, is that what it's called? Yeah, uh, yeah. Christmas Easter, you know, yeah. like uh, the, the, the hemorrhaging of... Uh, the christian churches in general yeah all of this like obviously it was gonna happen what did we think like this is this we've already mm -hmm. foreseen this like th this this kind of like institutional collapse of big organ or organizational religions like it's part of the process of the liberalization of the western world it's part of the process of the de-christianization so I think actually it's to me like it's kind of a sign of hope because it means that the church will become smaller, but more dynamic, more faithful, more open to the mystery in a much more authentic way. And so smaller actually might be better. So but that means we got to get to that small place where the few can intercede for the many. Right. The way to get there is hemorrhaging, unfortunately. So I think, for example, right now in church politics, you hear a lot of prelates talking about making sure everyone is welcome into the church, but maybe they don't want to be welcome. Why are we so focused on that? How about the crisis of faith for those who are already in the church? So it, this is just part of the process, I think, the corruption in the hierarchy, the craziness uh, on the ground, yeah. all these factions, the church is just, it's getting smaller. So it's okay. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I will say that the church getting smaller is objectively a problem, but you know, mm. I, I, I do, my mind immediately does go to the, you know, the, the 70 year exile that the, that the Jews faced. Um, yeah. and it's just like, Oh, did God like just punish them out? Or, you know, what, what did he do that? And then, but I, I really love the, the way that father Mike Schmitz explained it. It's like, it's less that God was just being mean and more of God was making the reality just simply visible. Yeah. These guys had already separated themselves away from God and the exile yeah. just made it visible. It was already yeah. their hearts had already been in exile. And then he, you know, Babylon Completely and Egypt came in. You. And yeah. yeah. So, exactly I, you know, I, 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 I think that that's uh yeah. Um, so I am going to read that quote from St. John Chrysostom again, because I think it's a very, very important um, thing to tie back, you know, to tie back into my comment of that. If you want good leaders in the church, have lots of sons and send them to seminary. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that 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 line from Chrysostom is also a very, very scary line of the road to hell is paved with the bones of priests and monks. And the skulls of bishops are the lampposts that light the path. Mm -hmm. So my encouragement to you is to pray for our priests, pray for our bishops with the same fervor that you would hope somebody would pray for your son if he became a priest, bishop, or you know, even a pope. So that is my encouragement to y'all is pray for these guys because every single one of these men, that's someone's son. You know, these men have mothers, or at least, you know, that probably since died. But, like, pray mm. for them with that fervor. Because every single one of these men are going to have to face their judgment. They will have to answer for the, the faithful that they lead astray. And their folly is not our glory. Like, you talked about uh, Father Altman, you know, being almost giddy with uh saying like oh his cronies are going to hell that is that's no that is not your glory that is that is a that is a call for prayer that is a call for reparations that is that's a sobering moment that's not a happy moment so yeah uh so yeah so that's my that's my final uh i don't want to call it a mic drop but uh dom <laughs> do you have any thoughts I'll, that you want to call it a mic drop no, yeah. not, I don't have any. I mean, uh, just that um, I think I think a lot of people saw it coming. 
Uh, I wasn't even following it that much, and I kind of saw it coming. Um, but uh, I think people need to uh, read Chapter 2 of G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. It'll, it'll, it's a breath of sanity. It's a breath of fresh air. It's such a good book. Yeah. So that would be my parting words is take the time to pick up Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton and to read that for a few days and to unplug from the Internet for a few days and kind of like a mini retreat at home. Go on a hike as well. That would be my advice. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And I guess to sum up the entire point of this video is basically to say it doesn't matter what wrongs happen to you. Your job doesn't change. You are still called to virtue. You are still called to holiness. And, you know, and part of that is obedience. And, you know, to say I will not obey, I will not serve, you know, non servium is literally the cry of Satan. And his words, oh, they sound so sweet, but they are poison and they will kill your soul. And on that note, I do want to go ahead and um, I do want to close with a prayer because that's I've been I have been calling for more prayer, more faithfulness, because, you know, I think I've even heard somebody say, like, you know, we get the leaders that we deserve. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we are a faithless generation. Uh, and it, it may be, maybe not you specifically, but look, look around you, the people that you regularly interact with. You can't say that like, this doesn't like make sense, you know, yeah. but, no, uh, yeah. but anyway, so, so here's the, here's this prayer. So anyway, in the name of the father and the son and the Holy ghost, amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of our priests through them. We experience your presence in the sacraments, help our priests to be strong in their vocation set their souls on fire with love for your people. Grant them the wisdom, understanding, and strength they need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Inspire them with the vision of your kingdom. Give them the words they need to spread the gospel. Allow them to experience joy in their ministry. Help them to become instruments of your divine grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns as our eternal priest. Amen. In the name of the Amen. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Uh, I was hoping this would last for an hour. Um, it's not. We didn't quite make it there. Uh, my encouragement to you is after if you've made it this far. Take 15 minutes. Go spend some time in scripture. That. The, the, the value of that is going to be far more than anything else. So anyway, God bless y'all. Have a good night, day, whatever time you're watching this.